The next guest that we have here is a prominent internet entrepreneur and an economist. He actually has a book out on why demographics are key to the innovation race, and he founded and is the chairman of Trip.com. James Liang joins us to talk about both of those things right now. James, honored to have you on. Thanks so much for joining us. Let me ask you first about the demographics question. It's so fascinating, and I wonder, does China follow up its uh, loosening of the regulations with supportive policies to help drive the birth rate higher? Uh, just relaxing the restriction on the number of children will not be enough. Uh, the latest uh, uh, fertility rate from the seventh census, uh, China's fertility rate is only 1.3. That's actually even lower than Japan, uh, which was you know, one of the lowest in the world. Uh, China needs to boost its fertility from 1.3 to a more sustainable level of 1.6, 1 1.7, the average level of developed country, or to even higher to like 2.1, the replacement level, replacement level, China has a long way to go. Uh, we are expecting China to completely reverse its uh, family planning policy to start rolling out uh, generous uh, support programs in the future. So what are the most important changes China could make in order to support a higher birth rate? What, what needs to be done to address the issue? Well, there's a lot needs to be done. Uh, like other developed countries with low fertility rate, China's government expects to uh, have cash bonus or tax subsidy, uh, especially social security tax or income tax uh, to couples, uh, especially couples in, live in the cities where uh, their burden of raising children is very high. And also China can do a lot in reducing the housing burden China is actually having the highest housing to income ratio in the world in major cities. And China can give um, you know, discount, uh, housing discounts to couples with two or three children. And that can certainly help up quite a bit. And uh, China needs to build a lot of daycare centers. Uh, the number of uh, children in the daycare center is very small compared to other developed countries. China needs to build tens of thousands of uh, daycare centers in major cities. And among many other things that China used to, uh, yeah. In the past, China, Chinese government is the only country you know, with a small fertility that is still, uh, you know, having restrictions on number of kids. Now China needs to completely reverse this policy and start rolling out generous and uh, aggressive uh, uh, social program to support uh, parents have more children. And this will spur innovation as well. It's not just about having more kids to pay for the graying population, right? Y your um, book is about how uh, a higher birth rate spurs more innovation. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, this is a long-term effect. You know, when these kids grow up, they will enter the workforce and they will increase the talent pool China will have. Also, will increase the the overall number of uh, researchers uh, for innovation. So I think the, the advantages that China has over the last many years uh, to really accelerate its innovation progress is this huge population, a large market and a huge talent pool. And that's uh, been jeopardized in a generation from now if China currently uh, have a, a very few kids uh, China's population is four times the U.S., but in terms of talent pool, it's probably only double because the U.S. has the ability to attract talents around the world. But that's an advantage of the doubling tap, uh, the talent pool is going to be reduced or shrink uh, in a matter of uh, you know one generation if China ha is having a fertility as low as 1.3. It's almost like reducing uh, the size of the cohort by half for each generation. And China's advantage of uh, uh, the more talent and bigger markets will disappear in just one generation. So that's going to jeopardize it's, China's uh, rise of in innovation uh, in one generation. It's really fascinating. It's, it's been a long time since you've heard anyone pitching reproduction as kind of a patriotic duty. And I'm sure that's going to come up now. James, let's get to the trip.com portion of your work. Um, 
how have you dealt with the travel restrictions and, and what does the picture look like to you right now? Well, uh, our main market, the China domestic market, has completed almost completely recovered. Uh, we have achieved a positive growth uh, pre-COVID compared to pre-COVID. Um, uh, we see modest increase in many markets, and we see very good recovery in the U.S. domestic market and a little bit in the Europe. We expect that Europe will start to recover uh, very well in the near future, and the U.S. obviously will do very well. Uh, but cross-region, long-distance travel will take another probably six to 12 months to recover. And in many Asian markets, uh, because the most Asian, other outside of China, Asian travel market uh, is uh, a smaller country. They have a relatively small domestic market. It will also take longer to recover. What kind, I mean, uh, so people are traveling shorter distances now, longer distances to come. Obviously, that's being held back by restrictions, right? What kind of pent-up demand do you see people on the site trying to make trips, trips getting canceled, you know, waiting to spend that money? Well, uh, if your domestic market is a big market like uh, U.S. and China, uh, people replacing international travel with uh, uh, domestic trips uh, and actually high-end domestic trips. We see that high-end hotels and uh, on, you know, the short, uh, even staycations within the same city, luxury hotels and resort hotels doing very well in China. And also we start picking up in the U.S. for the summer vacation. And I expect that, that Europe being one, you know, domestic or Pan Europe, you can think of the one domestic market, uh, is also uh, uh, will do well. Uh, but other places uh, where the mass market is small will have a, um, a long, much longer to recover.